introduction yes again uh, thank you for being patient with me because we already moved the seminar and also maybe it's not going to be so brilliant but uh, in any case I, I'm very happy to be here also uh, to discuss with Robert and also to, uh, to give the seminar to, to all of you uh, so actually I'm going to work about quantum frequency com for quantum complex network and uh, so my team is working on multimode quantum optics and so I just start with the outline. So the idea is that I want to give an introduction. So multimode quantum optics, why it is interesting, uh, what we are talking about. So the idea is that uh, if you think about quantum information, the kind of encoding that we, does, that we do is uh, on continuous variable. And then I start to sp uh, speak about why I'm interested in quantum complex network. And, and then how I want to implement this network via quantum frequency comp. Uh, kind of entanglement network, physical network, and also we explain something about non-motion network. Uh, so start with the multimode optics. So I start uh, from a very basic level. What is multimodes? So modes are modes of light or the normal solution of classical Maxwell equation. So you can think about light that uh, propagates with different polarization, different spatial shape, different spectral temporal shape. So I'm going to use a lot spectral temporal shape uh, during my talk. And what is nice is that uh, each mode of light can be described with an harmonic oscillator. Uh, and, well, an harmonic oscillator is well known in <coughs> classical optics, and you can try to describe the energy uh, by looking at the potential energy, but you can look also at the phase space. What is the phase space? You have uh, the position and the momentum operator, and as is well known, I mean, classical physics, you have one particular point and particular time. Uh, so, of course, you know that uh, I do quantum optics, so I, I do some quantization on that. And always, what we speak, when we speak about quantum optics, we recall all uh, the facts that we have some kind of discretization in energy. So we speak about photons. But it's not the only effort that you have. You have also some efforts on the phase space. So normally, the main effort is the one that uh, consists of an uncertainty principle. So you know that, uh, I mean, you can know, know the two variable with infinite precision and so on. And, well, you can also, in, in quantum optics, in quantum mechanics, you can keep both, uh, uh, both picture to describe what is going on. And it works exactly in the same way. So you can have complete description of the, I mean, for, for the moment I'm just speaking about one mode, so one harmonic oscillator. You can completely describe uh, via some statistical quantity. So in the discrete uh, energy picture, what you do is to build this object, which is the, uh, uh, the density operator. But then you have also the continuous variable description, kind of quasi-probability distribution that can be used to describe the statistic of the field. So you use them really like statistic props, so like joint probability distribution. So they are fancy when you are in the quantum world because they can be lower than one, lower, lower than zero, they can be negative, so they are not really 
probability distribution, but you can completely describe the statistic on the two on the two phase on the on the two uh, different picture. And also, actually, these two different picture can be used to encode quantum information. Uh, so the idea is that well, this is kind of encoding that is quite well known is the qubit encoding. Uh, so when you want to replicate the bit of the classical information, you use the, uh, in, the quantum, uh, in the quantum regime, you use this kind of encoding in which you have the superposition of 0, 1, uh, while in the classical case you have only 0, 1. And then what you want to do in this framework is to build any operation. And as, uh, I mean, uh, in, in normal inf uh, I mean, uh, information, what you want to build is universal gate set in a way that you can uh, perform any kind of information. So these are for, I mean, I'm not going to go into details, but you can build kind of uh, gates that can be used to perform any operation. This is in principle, I'll speak about theory for the moment. But you can do the same in the continuous variable encoding. Well, it's a little bit uh, more difficult to see, but again, this is a quantum state that can be used for the encoding. And uh, well, x are actually the position operator and then each state can be considered as f of x, uh, an integral over this position operator. And again, what you want to do is to do any kind of operation. So in the frame of continuous variable encoding, this means that what you want to do is to do any kind of unitary Hamiltonian evolution. So in that case, what you build is a universal Hamiltonian set, which is this one. Uh, so you see, this halo is not exactly the same color as this one. It's not as bright as this one. Uh, because, well, as far as the description is exactly the same, when you go to encoding, they don't work exactly the same way. As if you think about digital encoding and analog encoding on classical computer, they don't work in the same way. And specifically, if you stay in implementation in optics, uh, so you have kind of gated the hard to do, which are not exactly the, the same corresponding gate, in the sense that here, so I didn't speak so much about this three, but this C naught gate, well, is exactly the one that you have also in uh, classical computing, is a two photon gate. It is really the one that is hard to do. So to make photons speak one to, to each other. Uh, while the same, I mean, the corresponding gate, which is an entangling gate here, which is the CZ gate, is easy to do in optics. But is, what is very hard to do are kind of non-Gaussian operations. So I'm speaking about non-Gaussian operation because here, this set of Hamiltonian are set Gaussian, because if you apply them on a Gaussian state of light, meaning that this Wigner function is Gaussian, so the statistic of quadrature is Gaussian, is going to stay Gaussian after the application of this Hamiltonian. Well, this one is non-Gaussian, and this is really the hard part to do in uh, continuous variable encoding. Um, then, of course, up to now, I have been speaking only about one harmonic oscillator, one mode in my case. But you know, if you want really to have some real advantage in quantum information technology over the classic kind one, you need many of them. And so on, an, on one case, you need many photons. And on the other case, you need many quantum modes. Uh, so the photons can be generated generate probabilistically. But normally, the kind of operation that you do here have higher fidelity. So you really do the operation that you expect to do. While in the other case, uh, it's quite easy to have a lot of many quantum modes, but the fidelity is lower. So this is the other difference between the two modes. So again, saying that you can, you can think about the fact that uh, uh, as in classical computing, which is analog and digital, I mean, they, they don't work exactly the same way. This is exactly uh, also in, in, the, in, the quantum, in the quantum world. I'm not going to speak about the fact, if you really want to speak about computation, we have also to speak about error correction, which is a, a full topic uh, here. And still, you can find some, some which is quite advanced here, and it's very hard to get uh, full continuous variable uh, error correction codes uh, on the other case. Well, I'm on the continuous variable world, as uh, multimode quantum optics is a very good platform <coughs> for continuous variable encoding. So the sketch of what we can do uh, in our experiments, so this is really a sketch. I'm not explaining how I'm doing that, so it's going to be later. But what we can really produce are a lot of modes that, in my case, are uh, frequency modes of different shape. 
uh, which are entangled, and then you can build a kind of network uh, in which all the modern entangled. And the kind of entanglement that we have are quantum correlation between continuous variables. So position and momentum operator of uh, each moment. Uh, yes? When the total spectrum modes, do you mean just really the, the spectral components or also the phases of the uh, Could be the phase two, actually, in the sense that, uh, well, I, I'm going to, to be more precise later, but the idea is that we have a lot of wavelengths, and then we can compose any kind of, uh, I mean, modes, which is a superposition of this wavelength with a certain phase two. So, yes. Okay, so this is just for giving you a sketch, so I'm going to be uh, more precise later, and actually, now, I'm going to speak to you how I want to implement, how it's possible to implement this kind of network and why I'm interested. But before, I want to speak about why I'm, in, I'm interested in quantum complex network in general. So this is a kind of slide that uh, should not be presented to the audi this audience, because for sure you are more expert than me in complex network. Uh, but it's just for giving you my view, that maybe is going to be also wrong at some, some point. So uh, I look at complex network as being anything which is be between regular and random. And, well, why are interesting? As you know, because they can really describe a real-world network, a different scale, completely def different to each other. So you go from biology, you go from technological network, uh, internet, and so on. And then the idea is that you can classify them by statistical property, you can have emergent behavior and corresponding functionality to this kind of emergent behavior. Uh, so I was trying in the beginning to build different kind of network. So that the, the, I mean, the recipe that I use is to start by, I mean, if I start from a physical point of view, I want to describe at the beginning what are the nodes of my network. So it could be anything, it could be atoms, uh, and the links could be, for example, energy exchange. And then I, I'm trying to identify how, how the network grows, how it can be built, uh, by describing the probability of a new, new node being connected, and then that way I obtain a family of network. And then you can characterize them by collective properties, like, for example, the, uh, the degree, so the distribution of the degree. Uh, for example, here I'm considering the typical power law distribution. So why I'm saying that, so you know very well this kind of stuff. Uh, so this is a quite I mean, random paper of the many that I can consider in this field, speaking about the fact that, for example, if you look at formation network, well, you can see that some kind of network are more resilient than other, uh, for example, in transmitting information. And then you can also describe a kind of uh, uh, collective, I, I, I took a lot of collective uh, measurement, I'm not sure that you can uh, define them as collective, but at least these are nectar measurements, uh, like the density, the density, and clustering. And then again, I'm just uh, picking up one, one more recent paper about the fact that uh, looking, for example, this kind of property, you can have an idea which is the resilience parameter. For, for example, here you have a nectar of interacting species uh, against actually the environmental changes. Uh, why I'm speaking about all of this that you uh, should probably know better than me is just because I want to go quantum. So for me, being quantum, it means really you put quantum everywhere. In the sense that you can have quantum nodes, you can have quantum link rules, and, and then at the end you obtain family of quantum network, and then you can, you can characterize via, I mean, uh, collective uh, property that are again quantum. So what I mean, for example, uh, before I was considering the typical power law distribution, well, can, for example, use the same kind of distribution uh, for entanglement if you want to use quantum network uh, in quantum protocol? Uh, can I gain something with that? Could be interesting, uh, this part. Or, for example, can I use this kind of quantity for witnesses uh, quantum network properties? And so with that, uh, I come a little bit on the idea why complex network could be interesting in quantum information technology. So I, I see two different points. So one is the fact that, well, we can try to simulate behavior of a natural phenomena that both complex and quantum. So here I'm just picturing the uh, most uh, well-known example, which is quantum transport. Uh, so I'm not the one saying that I'm going to solve the problem of quantum transport, just to, to assure you, because I know that this, I mean, there's a lot of literature over there, there's a lot of people saying uh, I mean, one thing and the contrary of the same thing, so 
what I want to see is that I want to recover a kind of structure that you normally find in complex natural system in any system and trying to see if with this kind of structure you can have some advantage for quantum transport. But then I just want to borrow what I learned on the quantum platform, which is more on the second part. So here I'm speaking, for example, I'm picturing, this is the picture of internet. And well, as you know, maybe at a certain point we are going to have an internet which is going to be partially quantum. So the idea is that these are going to go the shape, to be the shape that is going to be the, the good one for, uh, for internet connection. Or maybe in the quantum case, we have considered a second one. Or as most probably, we are going to be partly uh, of the uh, internet, uh, which are classical, partly which is going to be uh, quantum, how the quantum part is going to survive in the classical component. So there are a lot of questions that uh, uh, can be interesting on, on that side. OK, uh, so this is more or less the framework uh, in which I'm going to speak about quantum complex network. And now I want to explain you how uh, I can build them. Uh, so as I was already saying, uh, the kind of network that I want to build are the one in which nodes are frequency temporal mode of the electromagnetic field. And, uh, and then I want to start about saying how I can implement edges uh, which are entanglement link in continuous variables. Uh, so the way we do that is using what we call quantum frequency cone. So what does it mean? It means that we, we just start uh, with uh, optical frequency cone, so a pulse laser. Uh, so you have train of pulses uh, in the time domain, and then you have a combo frequency in the, in the frequency domain. So you have a, a, why we use that? Because you have, in principle, a huge number of modes. Because the kind of, uh, we use femtosecond laser, at 800 with uh, a typical width of uh, tens of nanometers, so the kind of the number of modes that we can have inside are 10 to the 6. And then I want to couple, in order to have some quantum inside, I, want, I, I couple them with a uh, uh, process that I use in quantum optics, which is the parametric process. So here you see the parametric process in a linear crystal. Uh, uh, in, I mean, in the way normally we show it uh, to, for producing uh, Photons. So you have one blue photon that's times by times is just, uh, I mean, becomes two uh, twin red photon that are entangled and so on. As I was saying before, I'm not looking at the number of photons in my system. What I'm looking at are uh, quadrature. So this kind of system, for example, and normally we put them in cavity, uh, when you have the conservation of energy in a way that the two frequencies that are generated are the same, it used to produce quiz state. So if you look at the picture, that was the, the one that I was using before in the phase space, uh, you know that you have a minimum uncertainty uh, on the product of, the, uh, of x and p. But then you can decide to have one which is really low with respect to the other one. So you can squeeze one uncertainty by uh, 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 having higher uncertainty on the other, on the other side. Uh, but the same kind of system, uh, when I don't have uh, the degeneracy, so when the two frequencies are different, meaning that I'm, I'm producing two different fields, two different modes, uh, then these two modes are correlated in a quantum way. So that means that if I measure uh, a value of x and p here, is correlated on the value of x and p on the other side. In particular, uh, I mean, I get uh, x which is correlated and p which is anti-correlated, these kinds of systems. Uh, so when we merge the two, in the sense that I use my frequency comb to pump my parametric uh, crystal, so this is a picture of, of the experiment, and here you have a schematic of the experiment again, uh, what is going on is that you have many frequencies here, and then uh, if you look at only one frequency, as I was explained before, you can produce entangled state at two different frequencies. But then you, if you use another one, this frequency can be entangled also to this one. And then you go on. And then you have uh, a kind of non-trivial entanglement structure, because all the frequencies are entangled, depending on how actually they are connected to the different uh, part of the pump. Um, so how you can characterize them? Well, experimentally, we cannot really access at all the frequency, but we can access a frequency bound. And the way we measure quadrature, which are the, the one that they want to measure, is to use homodyne detection. So you mix your state that you are producing with a local oscillator, a 50-50 bit splitter, 
the two outputs are subtracted with respect to the other, what you get uh, is the value of x or p of, uh, of your state. Well, as homodyne detection is a projective technique, what we can do is to select one particular mode. What does it mean? It's just, I mean, the local oscillator uh, has a particular mode, a particular frequency, so meaning that I'm going to measure x and p on this particular frequency. And then I can also use superposition of frequency to generate uh, kind of other modes. But also what we can do in the lab is to measure all the different frequencies at the same time uh, by just dispersing the, uh, the signal after the mixture uh, a different wavelength. And then we use array of photodiodes. And then we subtract uh, two by two, the one that corresponds to, uh, to the same color in order to get the quadrature at uh, a different color in parallel. So when you do that, what you can build are uh, statistic, uh, statistics of your state. So actually, as we are considering Gaussian state of light, uh, what is enough here is to look at variances. Uh, so here we build the covariance matrices for the different. So here you have the different uh, bounds. And then you have correlation. You have the variance of one, uh, one bound and the covariance on the off-diagonal term. Uh, so what you can see in the diagonal part is the fact that one band could be squeezed or not if you are below the shot noise. So here the, the shot noise uh, is around zero. And what you have on the uh, off-diagonal term are the correlation, the quantum correlation between the different modes. So, so far so good. So they are uh, squared matrix. So what we can do is to diagonalize them. So if you diagonalize them, uh, when we pump uh, with the pump, which has a Gaussian spectrum, we obtain uh, this kind of situation in which actually the basis that we have to choose for diagonalizing uh, the matrix uh, is composed by a mid-Gaussian mode. And then we obtain a diagonal matrix. What does it mean? It means that in this basis, you have no correlation. Well, you have squeezing. But in this basics, the harmonic oscillator behaves like being independent. You have no correlation. So uh, this is a very important point. We can switch correlation to no, I mean, the kind of correlation you have to no correlation by changing the basis of mode that you are looking at. So when yeah. you say correlation, you say the same as entanglement? Entang yes, I'm speaking about entanglement here. Yeah. Entanglement continuous variable, yeah. And uh, so in a more general way, when we have this kind of system that I, I mean, I was speaking about Gaussian system that normally are uh, generated by using symplectic transformation. What does it mean? It means that if you look at how, for example, if you consider input-output relation of, uh, of this cavity, you have that the output quadrature are, uh, can be calculated from the input quadrature uh, by a symplectic transformation. And uh, this impacting transformation can undergo what is called a block messiah reduction. So block messiah reduction in optics has a very clear uh, meaning uh, because these two terms are basis change and this term, this delta term is squeezing. So this means that any kind of this system can be described as having some basis change and some squeezing at a certain point. Uh, then especially if, like us, we start with vacuum, we can discard the first basis change, because if you make a basis change on vacuum state of light, I mean, uh, there are going to be vacuum state of light in any case. So by using this picture, I can describe what I was speaking uh, about before. Uh, I, like if my system is squeezing in the super mode basis, so the one that I was uh, finding before, diagonalizing my uh, covariance matrices. And then, uh, depending on the kind of uh, basis that I choose to measure them, I have to apply a basis change. So here you have the basis change that goes from squeezing to the multipartite entanglement in frequency band, for example, that give us this kind of uh, quantum, quantum behavior. But this is, it means that I can use it uh, to build other kind of quantum correlation. So in particular, uh, so this is the way that we used to build cluster state. So cluster states are a kind of quantum network. So normally uh, they are a regular network in the shape, in which you have uh, each, uh, I mean, nodes, which is a mode of light, and then you have particular entanglement correlation. And so they are, they are useful for what is called measurement-based quantum computing. So when we stay in continuous variable regime, I mean, the, the method that works well is the, the measurement-based one. So meaning that 
instead of doing all the different Hamiltonian in a circuit model, uh, so you have an input state and you apply different Hamiltonian in order to get the results that you want, you start with a very complicated state uh, like this. You entangle the initial state with one of the nodes of this complicated structure, and then you make measure on all the other nodes except one, for example. And at the end of this one, you find the results of your calculation. It seems quite magic, but it works. So while, of course, you have to be able to, to, to measure in the right basis, to do it fit forward, but could be easier uh, in certain cases than applying uh, one after the other, the Hamiltonian as before. Uh, so here you have the receipt for building cluster states. So in general, you, you start with screen state of light, and you apply the, the operation that I was speaking before, which is the CZ, the entangling operation. But it can be recast as, I mean, again, the Gaussian state of light it can be recast as an squeezing and a particular basis change. So this is the way we do uh, in our experiment for being in this kind of cluster, meaning that we control the basis that we use for measuring, and it projects our state in a particular cluster. Uh, so these are the kind of cluster that has been measured in our experiment. Uh, with different shape. So here just, uh, I mean, this is what is called the squeezing of a nullifier, uh, saying that if you are below the short noise limit and you have really a quantum state of light that can be used for doing quantum, uh, quantum protocol. And, and then you can uh, increase the number of modes at, up to 12, uh, what we have done uh, up to now. So in principle, you have more, uh, more nodes in your system, but it's hard to, to measure them. Um, okay. Well, up to now I've been speaking about cluster, uh, which are uh, regular shape network. And then what I would like to do, to do is to go from regular cluster to complex graph. So why could be interesting? I have kind of graph states in which, I mean, the entanglement connection are arranged in a complex shape. Well, the idea is to use them to study entanglement percolation in concentration protocol or quantum routing in continuous variable network. And also to see if uh, you have kind of topology that could be useful for resilient uh, computation that normally is done in this kind of, uh, of network. Uh, so this is kind of work in progress. What we have been done up to now is to, uh, to see that we can produce any kind of cluster uh, of, of complex graph, uh, which again is the same trick. So here you have some formula, but it's again just the same, how normally the cluster is defined and the fact that you can build them by just starting from a set of squeeze state of light and then you can apply uh, a basis change. And uh, what could be interesting is that the fact that uh, if you start uh, with a, a realistic configuration in which you have different mode of light with different squeezing, which is normally what we get in our experiment, is that it's easier to build a uh, denser uh, network then not then yes. One clarification. Yep. The, so the links here is the entanglement that appears when you when the when the frequency comb passes through the non-linear system. Yeah. Actually I, I manipulate yes normally when you when you pass uh, through the uh, the frequency comb through the crystal you have an entanglement configuration. And, and then and then I, yeah, and then I manipulate this entanglement configuration in order to change the shape, the topology of the entanglement. But you don't have control. I have control on that. I have two control on that. One is the, uh, the measuring basis, and the other one is the shape of the pump that I can change in order to get different correlation. Okay, so depending on the, on the type of poles you put in, you get different network at the outputs. Exactly. Okay. And so this is for the moment is just theory, but uh, saying that uh, what we are looking at, so. Because if you speak about, or if you think about uh, entanglement network, so you know that uh, you have kind of uh, the monogamy of the entanglement. So now you can think that, I mean, you cannot grow any kind of network uh, very easily. Well, at first, this kind of, uh, I mean, argument works a little bit differently in the continuous variable regime. And again, as I was saying before, we are, we are uh, using uh, a realistic configuration in, in which you, uh, you lose all the kind of, uh, symmetry argument normally use in the for explaining the kind of monogamy of entanglement here. So what I'm saying if you start with a realistic configuration, building a network uh, which is denser, 
bring, being linked to a network which has higher quality, in the sense that is, we have more entanglement here than here, uh, if you look at each connection, which, I mean, at least at the beginning, seems quite uh, not so uh, intuitive. And so just for fun, we were trying to build and uh, to optimize a uh, different kind of network. And as we were seen before here, you see that if you increase the degree, uh, actually you have better quality. So uh, believe to me, this is, I mean, a uh, kind of quantum measure that <coughs> you can do uh, in order to see if the entanglement is good or not. And uh, again, for the random network too, you see that if you increase the degree, you increase the, the quality. But then you have something which is also interesting, the fact that it's easier to have good quality when you have regular networks. So here we are considering what's robots in which you have the rewiring, so you can go from regular to random uh, network. And you can see that the regular one has a uh, higher, uh, higher parameter uh, here. Uh, so what we want to do with this kind of network? Uh, so the idea is that we would like to see how it works kind of entanglement percolation. So when you speak about continuous variable network, what, what is easy to do is uh, have a network at the beginning, and then you can try to modify uh, the link in the network in order to, to get the right connection uh, in order to do your calculation, for example. While normally when you have discrete variable network, when you speak about percolation, you have kind of node, and then you try to do some kind of operation in order to connect the node that you are uh, interested to, to connect. Uh, so what we have looked at is we can, trans I mean, we can make a transformation from one network to the other one by linear transformation. As is expected, it's quite uh, easy to do if you make a global transformation, uh, meaning that they apply a linear optics on all the network. Um, and then even more, you can produce some useful state uh, even in a random way. So I'm not going to be... Uh, uh, to take a lot of time on that. But what I want to say is that you can have, so this is the kind of situation we, we are interested in that. So imagine that you share the part of the network between Alice and Bob. And then you want to uh, have one particular link, uh, which is an EPR link that you can use for making uh, teleportation, for example. So the idea is that I want to go from this network to this one. And I want to do that by local operation that Alice and Bob can do at their side. And the question is, is always possible. So we know that in this particular scenario, it's always possible when you have two, uh, two parties, Ellis and Bob, uh, at least for weighted graph with a large enough squeezing. Uh, but then you can have a more interesting situation in which you have four uh, uh, participants to this kind of network. And this is something that has to be studied. And you don't know how the, the topology of the initial network can uh, change this kind of product. So this is the role of the topology. And just to say what we want to study is are also kind of routing protocol in which you start to put uh, some non gaussian operation, but I don't want to say uh, a lot on this part. So I want to go more on the other part. So this was to say that entanglement and network are interesting because are the basis of many protocol, quantum protocol, quantum communication, and quantum information protocol. And then you can try uh, to see how the topology in complex shape can be uh, I mean, manipulated in order to get some particular uh, I mean, uh, property on, on protocol that you want to. Uh, what we had demonstrated is that we can also simulate with our platform kind of physical network. So what I mean with physical network is the fact that uh, we consider no more entanglement connection, but uh, physical interaction like spring-like coupling. So this is a work that has been done in collaboration with uh, Roberta here at Ivix and, um, and people also at the University of Turku. Johannes is part of it. Um, so how we can do that? So I was saying before that uh, we know how to manipulate symplectic transformation, which means just Gaussian transformation. And when you have this kind of situation in which you have spring-like coupling, so the Hamiltonian that you get, which look quite uh, complicated but is not, uh, can be described as input and output, uh, 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 I mean, picture, uh, by a symplectic transformation that can be solved totally. And again, this symplectic transformation can undergo what has been calling the block messiah uh, um, reduction. And meaning that if you consider a different network at different time and you look at the evolution of the network, you have, uh, you have different uh, picture of this, uh, uh, of 
this matrix as V that connects the <laughs> input with the output. And, and then if you just take one time, you can decompose this matrix uh, using these three matrix. And then just consider that uh, you can uh, discard the first one. Uh, well, these two matrix can be replicated in the laboratory. Because what we do is to implement exactly these two matrix in our multimode state of light. So what I can do is to emulate the behavior of the, of the network by replicating these two matrix on this one. So the kind of squeezing that I have can be controlled by shaping the pump of the parametric interaction. And the uh, basis change, again, is controlled by choosing the basis that I use in the, in the measurement. Uh, so this, uh, this picture uh, has been used to simulate, for example, structured quantum environment. Uh, so what has been done is to consider that uh, the network uh, that we want to, uh, that, that I was considering before, is the environment of a quantum system, and when we can look at the spectral density of environmental coupling. And uh, so these results are simulations that are based on the um, experimental parameters. So we we, we didn't do the experiment already, but we have the simulation that corresponds to experimental parameter. And, and actually, you have different curves that correspond to different parameters that we can adjust. So the, um, the, the, the uh, continuous curve is what you expect to get if you study the network. Uh, and then the rest are, cons um, co I mean, are the experimental uh, simulated parameters. And then it has been done for different networks. So at the beginning uh, with the Barabasi uh, Albert network, you have the Vatsa Strogatz. And we uh, were also trying to see a more uh, fancy network that you can find uh, in the real world, like uh, this uh, uh, cellular cortex uh, network. OK, uh, so I want to go to the last part uh, by speaking about Gaussian network. Uh, so what has been speaking up to now are is the possibility of creating uh, edge of uh, entanglement network uh, uh, and also edge uh, that correspond to physical interaction, uh, like spring-like spring uh, coupling. Uh, but what I'm doing here is a deterministic process, in the sense that I can deterministically generate this network in my experiments, but remain Gaussian. As I was saying at the, at the real beginning, uh, there is one a uh, little part that I had to add if I really want to do some quantum technology with that, which is some non Gaussian process, uh, which normally we can implement in a probabilistic way. So the kind of probabilistic process that we have implemented in the lab is the coherent mode dependent single photon subtraction. What does it mean? It means that I want to subtract a photon uh, from the network, but I want to choose from where I want to subtract, meaning that I want to subtract one particular node or a superposition of nodes. So how we can do this? So this can be done using, again, another nonlinear process, uh, which is the uh, sum frequency conversion. So here you have uh, the quantum state. So here I'm choosing to, uh, to, to use the diagonal basis uh, to represent it. So these are the modes that are squeezed. And when you have a mode squeeze uh, and you use the Wigner function representation, you have a Gaussian which is squeezed in a certain direction. And uh, so this state is going to a nonlinear crystal. And then you have what is called a gate beam. So it's a strong coherent uh, beam. And then sometimes you have a single photon which appear here at a different wavelength, meaning that you have subtracted two photons from here, one from this state and one from this state. So you are very interested about the fact they are subtracting a photon from this state. But actually, you can engineer the process in a way that you subtract a photon from the mode which is defined by this gate. So here you have, so we have what they're representing here, a coherent state of light in different modes. So if you have a superposition of modes, what I can do is to subtract a photon. So here you have the annihilation operation, so that really subtract a photon from your state, from a superposition of modes from your initial state. Uh, so if you don't believe it, it can be done. So I have experimental data, so these are quite recent data. Uh, so you start from the state. If you have no click, you can measure the state, and you obtain actually the, the, input, the same input state. Uh, so here are the three different modes in which you have a gaussian Wigner function. But then if you get a click, and you have injected the emit goes zero mode, so which is the Gaussian mode, well, here you get a different Wigner function for this mode, which is non-Gaussian. 
And particle is negative, which is something which is considered even more useful if you want to do some kind of quantum information puzzle with that. And then you can do the same with the other modes. So here you inject the mid gauche one, and here you get a uh, negative invariant function. And on the third mode, it's not negative, but, uh, but it's no quotient in any case. And then you can do something more. So here, what I've pictured on, on this part is just having four different nodes. So my four different nodes are just the different mode of light. So for example, HG0, HG1, HD2. And then I'm subtracting one photon from one particular mode. But then I can build a cluster between these modes. I can start to subtract a photon from one node of this cluster. So the node of this cluster, as I build the cluster by making basis change, correspond to a combination of a particular, or a particular combination of the initial modes. And, and then uh, I can just send this mode here. And when I have a click, it corresponds to subtracting a photon from these nodes. Uh, and here, again, you think some strange feature in the sense that uh, if I have this cluster and I subtract the photon from this mode, the most affected mode is the one on the other side. And you can have also more complex structure. Here you have, for example, a squared cluster, and then you have two more nodes. And then you subtract the photon from this one, and you see that this is one of the mostly affected. And then you have some, so these two are a little bit affected, but then you have this one that is more affected than these two. So you have kind of interference given from the fact that you have two parts. And then when you go uh, to the third uh, mode, it's not affected at all. So this is well understood in the sense that given the structure of cluster, uh, you can no, not do some local operation on one node that can affect uh, up to the third. So you can go up to the second. But all this kind of interesting picture, I mean, well, we, start, I mean, we have some theory on that, but there is a lot of thing to do in the sense of understanding how actually you can do this kind of, so how this kind of operation can affect the topology and how, how you can really uh, affect the non-gashanity, the topological non-gashanity if you want on this kind of, uh, of states. So what we can do with that, uh, well, the idea is that we want also to have more, uh, for example, addition uh, in a, in a mm -hmm. more dependent way. We have, want to uh, do multi-photon subtraction. And the kind of protocol that we can look at in this regime is to look, for example, kind of quantum advantage, uh, quantum transport in CV complex network. So what I mean, uh, I have this network, uh, which is the one that I have, I mean, the kind of cluster network I have been doing before, and then I put some negativity somewhere, which is like putting an excitation, like putting, for example, a single photon in this scenario. And then I want to see what I have to do to move efficiently this negativity from this mode to, to another one. So it's similar to the quantum transport. It's not exactly the quantum transport, but uh, I think there is a, a, a good, uh, a good <coughs> And then the idea is that maybe by using this kind of scenario, we can uh, do some random walk maybe some spatial search, and then either, well, this is a kind of thing that maybe in five years we are going to do something kind of kind, CV, quantum machine learning, and quantum neural networks. Uh, just to say uh, something more, very uh, last thing, is the fact that when you uh, try to subtract more photons, it's even more complicated to describe this kind of state. So when you have multi, uh, multi-mode state of light and you start to subtract photon from them, uh, having a full description of the state is not easy. So the idea is that we can borrow some way, some classification from the clone complex network in order to classify the state. So this is actually is not uh, my idea. It's something that has been done by uh, Lincoln Carr by considering uh, a spin chain. And uh, he was able to see the ferromagnetic paramagnetic transition of this spin chain by looking at the complex network of correlation between the spin, uh, meaning that you build uh, the kind of cluster in density operator by using uh, the mutual information. So, I mean, another measure of quantum correlation, in the sense that you measure the quantum correlation that you have between the spin chain. And then you can see that you have a transition. So you can recover the, the phase transition by looking at this quantity. 
so actually, we are not looking at a phase transition. But the idea is that uh, what we want to do is to see how our Gaussian cluster that we can, uh, for example, picture here uh, by looking at disparity in the clustering for different kind of shape uh, move in this picture when you start to subtract and add uh, more photons. So this is completely work in progress, because that will give you an idea that we can, uh, we can use uh, complex nectar measurement in order to classify quantum state of light. Uh, okay, with that, I, I'm finishing. So as Roberta was saying uh, before, so I have been awarded by a near C very recently. And right now we are looking at the experimental postdoc. Uh, so this is just an advertisement. Uh, and, and then I, I want to just thank you for your attention. If I understood well, in the picture that you shown uh, of the cluster, you said that the first neighbors were not affected, but the second neighbor was affected. Yes, actually, it depends uh, if I'm right, because this guy could be wrong. Yeah, yeah. When, when you have this kind of geometry, you have these two that are not affected, but this one is affected more. Yeah. And what happens if you connect between the connection between them? Between the, the two? Between these no. two? Between yeah. these two? Yeah. Uh, I cannot say like that, but I think you get some... Uh, it's going to be affected less yeah. than undergoing towards these two paths. So it's like that here you have just one path. If you're just like this one, you have just one path. Yeah, maybe if you add the third path, I think it's going to be a, a even more affected. So yeah. I see it like an, a, a kind of interference uh, effect. Uh, well, you can think about that, the fact that this link are entanglement link. So you have correlation between the modes. So if you add more link, you have more correlation. So it means that if you do something here, I mean, you are, you are more affected on this one because it's, uh, it's uh, correlated with this. This can be interpreted in terms of the normal modes of the object? Uh, you don't need to go to the normal mode. It's more on the, on the cluster structure. How, I mean, you, you have the entanglement between the different so, for example, the fact that you go to the second and not to the third is the fact that as uh, you have now, you have this quadrature which is correlated with this one and this one, meaning that you have some correlation also between this one and this one. But then you, when you go to the third, there is no correlation. It really depends really on the tangent structure, not really on the initial normal moves. No, this, uh, this picture here. Emilio? I have two questions. One is uh, how large is the cluster? Because you can build the number of nodes. It's a very good question. So for the moment, we have something like 16 nodes. Uh, but we are mainly limited by the fact uh, that we cannot detect. So in principle, we have more quantum nodes in our system, but we, can, we cannot detect them because they are larger in frequency than our local oscillator. So we are broadening the local oscillator in order to see if you can detect more modes. And on the, also, we are building another experiment in which we use time multiplexing. So we use as degree of freedom uh, the pulse uh, of, the, uh, of the laser. And in that case, in principle, we can have a million of moons. Uh, it has been <coughs> demonstrated by a group in, uh, in Japan, uh, Akira Furuzawa demonstrated can have, can have uh, one million of moons in this kind of class. But not, they are not always there at the same moment, because as you use the time uh, as degree of freedom, but, but you can have your and the second was, I, am, I don't really know what, what is the system. Mm -hmm. and you have some cavity in which there is some light, and then you, you have some output and you measure with some photodetector. And yep. you say that by, by measuring at the photodetector, you're changing the state of the system. Yep. Usually, well, yeah, this is quantum mechanics, but usually when you measure, you destroy correlation, not introduce them. But you are yes. introducing correlations by measuring? Is this what you are doing? Uh, actually, I'm just changing the correlation. So the global state is always the same. Is that I'm looking at the state uh, with a different basis. But this you can have, for example, if you speak about, for example, qubit, and you have entanglement qubit uh, in a particular basis, uh, if you make a global transformation, you can have completely non-entangled qubit. So for example, if you go from H and D polarization to uh, diagonal and anti-diagonal, for example. This, this is a kind of transformation. It's just a basis change in the sense that uh, I have to choose the basis for making my measurement, and this is going to change the global correlation of the state. Then you are, you are right, in the sense, when I measure, it's done. I cannot do anymore. 
But then what I can do is if I want to do all my calculations, so imagine that I want to do a quantum information protocol, in this kind of scenario in which you have a large cluster, <coughs> uh, I mean, the, me the measurement is at the end. But in the measurement at the same time, make the calculation and create also the structure of the cluster. <laughs> yeah, I know that it takes time to <laughs> digest this part. Yeah. Um, so you say that the, the links are created by the non You use the frequency comb, <coughs> really classical, I guess. Yeah. Is the non-linear crystal that creates the... The quantum part, yeah. But the frequency comb can also come from a, 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 a non-linear process, like a three-crystal crystal. Mm -hmm. That uh, the frequency comb at the origin would already have some quantum correlation. Well, if you want, yes. I mean, but then, I mean, when you, when you start to make, I mean... Okay, which, which never will be that one, no, not, not, in, I mean, not, not in our you case, because you have a classical laser in the sense that, uh, you know, I mean, we measure the, la actually, we have uh, other projects that measure the noise of the laser is a classical noise. <laughs> so, because, you know, in a larger uh, number of photo regime and so on, actually. But, but, of course, you can do, kind, I mean, the kind of process that we do, in which we subtract a photon, at first we have a chi process, and then we have another chi process. So of course you can you can put uh, I mean a line of different kind of process in order to add uh, quantum uh, quantum properties of, on your system of course. But then I mean uh, normally when you have quant when you are in the quantum regime uh, you need a weak gain in this kind of protocol because I mean we are more or less in the same kind of single photo regime when you get this kind of squeezing. Well, you can, you can go above, but let's say that compared to a classical laser, you're more in this kind of few photon regime. And, and th this means that, I mean, the probability of having more than one process going on. Well, of course, uh, when you look at continuous variable, you can have one after the other, which is completely deterministic. Uh, but then as is weak, uh, I mean, if you start to add one quantum process to the other, well, I don't know if it's going to work quite well, but could, in principle, could work. Other questions or comments? So if not, let's end the meeting again.